So beliefs come from people they don't just float in the air. It takes real people to transmit beliefs. And if you say that certain beliefs are incorrect, then the people who transmitted those beliefs were, for some reason, transmitting incorrect beliefs. The point is not to convince the reader of anything in particular that comes later, but simply to sort of blow the lid off. And this lid is on what I call the main narrative of U.S. history. It was put in place at the low end, before puberty, and at the high end, after puberty. The low end. Let me tell you about the Pacific Northwest tree octopus. The Pacific Northwest tree octopus, Octopus paxarbolus, can be found in the temperate rainforest of the Olympic Peninsula on the west coast of North America. Their habitat lies on the eastern side of the Olympic mountain range adjacent to the Hood Canal. These solitary cephalopods reach an average size, measured from arm tip to mantle tip, of 30 to 33 centimeters. Unlike most other cephalopods, tree octopuses are amphibious, spending only their early life and the period of their mating season in their ancestral aquatic environment. Because of the moistness of the rainforest and specialized skin adaptations, they are able to keep from being desiccated for prolonged periods of time, but given the chance, they would prefer resting in pooled water. Now this website was set up saying all of this and going into great detail about the Pacific Northwest tree octopus and shown to 7th graders in Connecticut, and all 25 of them in the class fell for it. And the age of 7th graders is of course 12 or 13. At age 3, about 69% of children believe in Santa Claus. At age 5, it's up to 83%. At age 7, 63%. Age 9, it's 33%. By age 12, it's still a whopping 5%, which is 1 in 20 people. So in class of 30 kids, you will on average have 1 to 2 kids who still believe in Santa. But if 5% of 12-year-olds still believe in Santa, well, the others, the ones who don't, aren't exactly a million miles ahead of those who do. Which is to say, the 12-year-old population still has one foot in early childhood, the kind of mind that can believe in Santa. And those younger kids who don't believe in Santa, well, that's not necessarily a reflection of their ability to think critically. It may just be that their parents or siblings told them early that Santa isn't real. Knowing this, it's important to ask, what is being taught to people when they still believe in or are still very close to the kind of mind that can believe in Santa Claus? At age 5, lessons on slavery in the United States begin. At age 8, lessons on racial segregation in the United States begin. At age 11, lessons on the Holocaust begin. And age 12 was the age of the students for the tree octopus experiment. So these things are being taught before the brain is properly developed. So after one has taught these things at ages well before the brain is fully developed, this certainly is going to influence how they interpret any issue that involves white people and non-whites. It's done at an age where they have zero context to put any of it in and zero ability to think critically. And there is a laser focus on blacks in the United States. And it is not compared to, say, blacks in Africa or whites in Russia or how life was for the typical Chinaman or Indian. So these kids, not long ago toddlers, are being made to emotionally feel for the sufferings of one particular group blacks at the hands of whites. And in adulthood, you see white privilege and police brutality. They're taught about the desperate optimism of slaves at the time. But what about desperate optimism of white farmers who were probably less food secure than blacks at the time? Each of these individual narratives both establish and reinforce a meta-narrative of white people oppressing non-white people i.e. you hear about racism in the boardroom, or that becomes just another form of white privilege slash oppression. And to be white is to be the oppressor in this overarching story. So that's the low end. The high end. In any religion you have the version of the religion for children and the version of the religion for adults. Now, if someone is raised Christian and given Christianity for children, the low end, but is never given the more complex and reasonable sounding arguments for adulthood, the high end, they are likely to abandon Christianity. And Christianity, like all religions, is dependent on getting people as children and then reinforcing the beliefs later in life. Adult conversions do occur, but it's much easier to get the kids. But to maintain that belief into adulthood, you need something at the high end. The way people are persuaded about whites being oppressive and harmful to blacks during slavery in the U.S. during segregation is not based on any kind of data 
or statistics. If you think I'm making a bold claim here, just think back to your sessions about slavery. Do you remember a lot of tables and charts being used? Of course not. That's not what they were appealing to. They weren't using proper evidence. They used broad claims backed up by anecdote and descriptions of the time. But that's okay, because you knew that off somewhere else there are these great historians who have the truth about slavery all sewn up. They know how many slaves face corporal punishment compared to non-slaves. They know how much slaves got to travel compared to non-slaves, etc., etc., right? They just aren't sharing this data in high school textbooks. They don't need to. I call this magic science man syndrome. Now, do you think that black slaves worked more than free white farmers? Of course you do. They were slaves. It was horrible. The narrative dictates that they worked harder and longer, and they were whipped to boot. You probably know Toby's personal story about it, even if it was historical fiction. The first investigation of how many hours slaves actually worked compared to free white farmers was done in 1976 by John Olson. 1976, that's 111 years after the end of slavery in the United States. And he found that slaves worked less than free whites. The standard narrative on slavery that you were taught dates back to at least the 1930s, but probably well before that, well before any of this basic research was even done. So the line on slaves working particularly long and hard hours doesn't come from any data or evidence and was put out there before the necessary data or evidence even came into existence. Not until 2015 was there any follow-up on how long and how hard slaves worked, with two separate investigations done by Alan Olmsted and Trevon Logan, both done in 2015. Again, they found that slaves did not work particularly hard. Or how about corporal punishment? That's something that must be very well established. Well, the data on that simply doesn't exist. The only reliable records that quantitatively document corporal punishment are done by Bennett H. Barrow one guy's records from one plantation. But this, of course, doesn't stop the textbook writers or filmmakers from pushing the corporal punishment trope, nor does it stop them from impressing upon five-year-olds that black slaves worked particularly hard. Or we can talk about rape. Here's a passage from Thaddeus Russell, A Renegade History of the United States. Quote, Statistics further suggest that rapes were rare on plantations. Most people of mixed race in the South were either slaves who lived in cities, where opportunities for interracial liaisons were far greater or free. According to the 1860 census, 20% of the urban slave and 39% of the free blacks in southern cities were mulattoes. But among rural slaves, who made up 95% of the slave population, only 9.9% were mulatto. Of the slave population as a whole, mulattoes made up only 7.7% in 1850 and 10.4% in 1860. Moreover, only 1.2% of the former slaves interviewed by the Works Progress Administration in the 1930s reported being raped by a master, only 5.8% reported hearing about the rape of another slave, and only 4.5% said that one of their parents had been white. According to Fogel and Angerman, all of the available evidence taken together indicates that the share of Negro children fathered by whites on slave plantations probably averaged between 1 and 2 percent. Even Fogel and Angerman's most hostile critics concede that it was no more than 8 percent. There's also evidence of significant numbers of consensual relations between white men and slave women, which would make the percentage of children produced by rape even smaller. It's interesting that today we take rape accusations with a grain of salt, demand evidence, but immediately presume that white men were really interested in raping black women in the 1800s. Today, white men almost never rape black women, and most white men aren't even interested in black women sexually at all. And so the profound claim that white men in the past were obsessed with black women should require a great deal of evidence. And if you were presented the rape claims as an adult, you would probably demand evidence. White guys raping, but you were presented it as children. And so instead of this being seen as a politically racially loaded accusation of white men raping black women, it was instead seen as a historical fact 
because it was told to you at a time when you couldn't filter anything out, when you probably believed in Santa Claus. And so instead of being a claim to be evaluated, it became part of your foundational understanding of the world. In my opinion, what happened is that the abolitionists won the propaganda war and got their view of slavery put into the minds of the public shortly following the Civil War, and it was never really checked until very recently. Certainly there was a propaganda war, and when it's put into textbooks, who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe the abolitionists, or are you going to believe the pro-slavery side? If the abolitionists say there was an epidemic of white men raping black women, well, they won the war, their ideas got put in the textbooks, and so that's what you're told happened at an age where you like to play with action figures. This is why the revisionist charge is so bizarre. First off, revision shouldn't be a bad word. History should constantly be revised. But second off, they act as if there is some great empirical edifice on slavery when in fact there is none. It's three studies, and they go against narratives set at age five. There's no magic in those bricks. As grand, old, and expensive as the architecture of the university may be, and as formal as the titles and administration may be, the knowledge on a subject ultimately comes from suddenly normal people. Real people have limits, they have to teach, they go on vacations, they like their free time, and they have bugaboos they seek to prove just like you. If you find this lack of investigation in, into what we think of as basic history shocking or hard to believe, well, why is it shocking? How many historians are there? And specifically, how many historians about slavery? And specifically there, how many actually do primary research of those who focus on slavery? A thousand? Ten? A hundred? If your belief in all of these things is based on trust in authority, this is something you probably need to know. The number of people in the U.S. actually employed as historians is 3,500. The number of history teachers in colleges and junior colleges is around 23,650. How many of those people, either the employed as historians or employed as history teachers, how many of them do any kind of primary research? Let's be generous and say there are 30,000 people with history PhDs who work either as a historian or history teacher. This is a rough estimate based on the number of history PhDs awarded each year and what proportion of them get employed in the field. And let's be generous again and say 10% of those do any kind of primary research. Now we're at, say, 3,000 research historians. Okay, how many of them deal with the history of the United States? Well, Wikipedia lists 448 historians who study the history of the U.S. This includes some dead historians, but also doesn't include some ones who are probably still alive. So let's say there's around a thousand research historians who deal specifically with the United States. Of those, how many of them specialize on slavery? Even if a historian specializes in the United States Civil War, he is unlikely to do primary research on the plight of slaves. Well, depending on the year, slavery concerned about 15% of the U.S. population for 89 years of the existence of the United States, and of course, some proportion before that. So, now you're going with maybe 150 research historians who specialize on slavery in the United States. That's probably closer to 75. But okay, 150 people. What are they researching? Even those who are researching slavery are not necessarily researching basic narrative. They may be researching, say, the role of women in slave society, or the relation between African folk traditions and Christianity in the slave camps, or something equally banal. Remember, specialization is the name of the game in history today. And for those who do basic research and specialize on slavery, and are investigating the basic narrative questions, things like living standards, work hours, use of corporal punishment, education. When you get down to any one of those topics, you're dealing with 5 to 15 people. You're dealing with a handful of people. You're dealing with, with for the question of work hours, you're dealing with around 8 guys who study the subject. And they aren't reaffirming what was taught in kindergarten. In fact, on the whole, they're finding new things. And in fact, why should one be surprised about what they find? This is the first time the research has ever even been done. But of course, there are a countless number of teachers who are teaching about slavery, and they would be concerned at the lack of primary research on slavery, right? Certainly, out of all these teachers, millions over the years, certainly they would have voiced some concerns by now. Well, 
a school teacher teaches a whole bunch of topics, and they're more concerned in general with conveying the curriculum and showing that students understand what is being taught. Could it really be that nearly zero teachers voice any concerns about the veracity of claims about slavery, claims being taught to five-year-olds? Of course. Say you get that high school teacher, maybe one in a hundred, if that. It's probably not even that high, but let's say there's one in a hundred who even has these concerns. First off, how important does he think these concerns are? He may think it's unimportant, trivial, and may just ignore it. Second off, how long will he think about these concerns before he has to grade 150 papers and move on to the next lesson about the Great Depression? Third off, if these concerns about the veracity of claims about slavery really got to him, what could he do? Who would he even voice his concerns to? And fourth off, even if he thought up some plans to voice these concerns in an effective way, would he even bother to go through with it? So right there, there's at least four factors that would explain why virtually zero teachers over the millions who have existed over the years would ever voice these concerns in any way that would ever reach the public. What about the administration, the textbook makers, the councils where curriculum is decided? Do you expect them to care or even know? The point is, it looks really big and authoritative at first glance, but when you boil it down, it's a shockingly small number of people doing basic research. You know, you see the same names over and over again in the literature. It's a little group that could fit into a single classroom. It would be pretty cramped, but they could still fit into a single classroom. And when you boil it down further to any really specific thing, such as hours worked, such as proportion of people raped, then you're getting down to maybe five, ten people. Politics. Let me ask you this. Is the presidency of Barack Obama a matter of historical record or a matter of politics? Or the George Bush presidency, is that history or politics? How about Bill Clinton, history or politics? To ask this question is to make clear that the distinction between history and politics is one of convention and not reality. You certainly wouldn't dismiss any revision of the Obama or Bush presidency as being illegitimate on the grounds that the record is set or something. Now, you may oppose it because you think that the revisions are incorrect, or you may not like revisions being done by a, a partisan hack, but you're not fundamentally opposed to revision. But if we reach further back and say something like, segregation wasn't immoral or harmful to blacks, well, up bubbles the lessons from the third grade. You're going after something there that is seen as being more set, as seen as more established, as not a political claim, but a historical fact. But you only think that because you were told it at a much younger age and with all the trappings and confidence and signals of academic authority. What if it were reversed, where the crimes of the Obama presidency were taught to kids, with graphic images of bombings being shown to five-year-olds who lack the ability to understand the context? Sure, by the time they're adults, you can explain the context to them and say it wasn't quite so clear-cut if they don't think you're the devil for even questioning it in the first place by then. Starting at age five, getting more sophisticated, as they get older, learning about the horrors of Obama from multiple teachers, not just one teacher. You know, sometimes having movies and documentaries about it, you know. Hear the story of Brian Lake, a Tea Party activist who was assaulted by Obama's thugs in the struggle for free speech, free association, and civil rights in the dark days of the Obama regime. A historical fiction based on real events. Do you think kids taught this at age eight are going to be very open-minded? about Obama by the time they're 20? And what if the history of segregation was the domain of bloggers? Martin King wouldn't be a sacred figure. If anything, he'd be more like Ronald Reagan, a political figure, lionized by some and seen as a short-sighted boob by others. In addition to being only nominally distinct from politics, there's no underlying expertise to the historian. In physics, you have to learn a lot of things that are tested, proven, and undeniably true before you can go on to higher things. In history, so-called history, there is no foundation or underlying expertise. It's all just a whole bunch of facts weaved into stories. There's no real hard break between the historian and the non-historian. If you know half as much as a formal expert on U.S. fighter aircraft, well, then you're halfway 
to knowing as much as the formal expert. Okay, it's not like chemistry or engineering where it, there's a whole integrated system. And if you don't know how the integrated system works in chemistry or some engineering field, then knowing a whole bunch of facts is meaningless because the layman has no way to make sense of any of these facts. If you know half of all the facts about engineering, you're not halfway to being a trained engineer because there's a whole fundamental underlying expertise that needs to be established before you can do anything. With history, that's not the case. If you know half, you're halfway there with history. It's just a series of facts that different people make sense of in different ways, like with politics. History is politics. The distinction is nominal. Views about history inform political views because views about history are political views.